Let's stand now as we sing our faith. It is well with my soul.
Well, amen. You always sing it so well. Thank you so very much. Now there are two or three things about that song. All of you know the story, of course, of Horatio Spafford, who wrote it, a banker uh, in New England. And uh, he uh, is rumored to have written it once he took the boat uh, out to the place where his wife and his daughters had capsized at sea. And uh, that is not true. It is far more amazing story than actually the one that gets told. Actually, he was at his home when he was given the information that the ship had sunk at sea and that at that point he believed all of his daughters, all three of his daughters and his wife had all perished. As it turned out a little bit later, uh, his wife had not drowned and uh, had been saved and so uh, but at the moment when he was informed that they were all gone he went immediately to his back room and within moments of having been informed of this he wrote that song uh, it is well with my soul i love to use it because it is a classic expression of confidence in the providence of almighty god that though we cannot understand and cannot comprehend, cannot get our arms around things that God allows in his providences to happen, it is still well with my soul. And the stanza, the third stanza, really the second and third stanzas of it are about as close to inspired literature as you'll ever get anywhere as they focus on the atonement. As Dr. Ducine called our attention to that doctrine on yesterday, and they are magnificent verses. Now I want to tell you a sad side to it that you don't nearly hear, that you don't usually hear. Uh, and it's a warning to you. Uh, the warning is that Horatio Spafford ended up very sorrowfully in his life. Uh, he went to pieces in the latter days of his life because he forgot what he had written. It is well with my soul. And so he finished tragically in life, and uh, that can happen. You can be on a mountaintop, and the next minute you can be in the valley. And you have to be careful to keep your walk with God. Don't ever get too busy to keep your walk with God, or all the great things that have happened to you in life will founder and fail if you do not keep your walk with God. So it is a challenge to us to remember to be faithful to the Lord in those things. A great hymn, no matter what happened to him in the latter days of his life, it is still true. It is well with my soul. But if today there's never been a time when godly sorrow worked repentance in your own soul and you reached out in faith to receive Christ as your Savior, it is not well with your soul. And if you keep having the inkling that things are not well with your soul, don't let the fact that you're a student in seminary keep you from getting with somebody and saying, it is not well with my soul. I need a little help here. And you're not a professor here that will not stop and work with you and walk with you uh, in that moment. So be sure that it is well with your soul. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, how we thank you today for this marvelous song, which is so very true. And Lord, we thank you that for those of us who have received Christ as Savior, no matter what the Supreme Court of the United States does, no matter what the executive office does, no matter what Congress does, no matter what the United Nations does, no matter what anybody does, it's still well with our soul. And Lord, we thank you and praise your name today for the fact that we can have that confidence that it is well with our souls. And Father, we pray for those even here on the seminary campus, and we know there are some, who, uh, for whom it is not well with their soul. And Lord, they're struggling with all kinds of things, and understand that, that's the way of, of life itself, but Father, how I do pray that during the days of their sojourn here, that they will be arrested by the spirit of the living God and that they will find the Lord and that they'll be able to say upon graduation, I've got a diploma, but I've got something more important. It is well with my soul. And Father, I pray 
that you would make that come to pass here. Lord, we pray for those today who sorrow for the loss of loved ones. We pray uh, for students who have tough decisions uh, awaiting them. And Lord, we pray for all of our students as we come up toward final exams and and uh, toward finishing papers and all the pressures that come upon us toward the end of the semester. And we ask you, Lord, that you would enable each student to uh, have the energy and the zeal to finish the projects at hand and uh, get on down the line. And Lord, we thank you today for our speaker. We pray that your blessings would rest upon him as he comes to bring us God's message for this hour. In Jesus' holy name, we pray. Amen. And thank you, and you may be seated. And as we continue reading through the book of Acts in just a moment, Mr. Greg Nelson's going to come. He's a third-year MDiv student from the state of Georgia, and he is uh, married and uh, has a daughter. And we are grateful for Greg today as he comes to lead us in reading through the book of Acts. Looks like to me that we may finish Acts next semester. But what a wonderful journey it has been through the book of Acts just to see the mighty hand of God uh, at work in the early church. Then we're going to sing together, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And then I'm delighted to present to you today our speaker, uh, Dr. Hayes Wicker. I have known Hayes since Hector was a pup, and uh, I have watched God do wonderful things in his work. He is married to Janet. They have three wonderful kids, a um, uh, son who is a preacher of the word uh, and uh, has been a student here at this school. And uh, they have four grandchildren, which is, of course, what really matters. And uh, so they have four grandchildren. He had an experience similar to my own and yet somewhat dissimilar. Um, he was at a New Year's Eve party in Phoenix, Arizona. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Phoenix, you know that New Year's Eve party was probably not a good thing uh, in Phoenix. But even if it were a good thing, it was unusual to find the Lord at one. He was saved at that, good, at that New Year's Eve party and was, you know, it was good that he was still sober. And uh, so he was saved uh, at that New Year's Eve party. But the very same night, he knew that God was calling him to preach. That's what we have in common. Because I knew even before I was saved that that was going to happen, which is why I resisted the Spirit of God for quite some time. Uh, didn't have in mind doing this. But anyway, uh, he was saved and called to preach that same night. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree in sociology from Grand Canyon University out in Arizona where he grew up. Then came here and did an MDiv and a PhD uh, here in 1979. We're uh, grateful to have him serving now at Naples, First Baptist Church, Naples, Florida, Florida since 1992, having previously served pastorates in uh, Texas and Oklahoma and New Mexico. Now, I, I want to tell you two things about Hayes Wicker that you need to keep in mind as he comes to bring us God's message today. First of all, he's done it right. He has gone there to that church and he has stayed and he has seen it through to a great congregation. What you pray for is that when he dies, you get called to that church, okay? Because uh, he is leaving a church in the shape that it ought to be left in. It doesn't mean it's easy. There is no such thing as an easy ministry. If you came into the ministry thinking that this is going to be a bed of roses, welcome to Cactusville. Uh, you have come instead of a bed of roses to a bed of saguaro cactus. You know what those are like. And... Uh, and those are not so bad, but it's a dog cactus that you got to go through while you're trying to get to the saguaros. And that's what gets you. And so uh, the fact is that it is not easy, but he has done a magnificent work there. Now, as you know, in order to live in Naples, Florida, uh, and uh, you, you not only have to uh, get there, but you have to have your first million. And uh, so he works with uh, a clientele that is often considered to be upper class clientele monetarily. And everybody knows those people are hard to reach. He doesn't know the difference. They're all people. He's figured that out. And consequently, he has an incredible 
ministry with them, working in so many different places, leading those people to Christ. I've run across all kinds of people that uh, are leaders in our social order who found the Lord through his ministry at First Baptist Church Naples. That's the way it ought to be, folks. That's why I love this man and thank God for him so very, very much. Not only that, but he stood solidly across the years when it was not kosher to stand strong for the things of the Lord. He has faithfully stood and been counted, and I love him for it very, very much. So we're going to read the scripture together and then sing, and then I want you to listen with open heart and mind to Dr. Hayes Wicker. If you are willing and able, please stand for the reading of God's word. We are in Acts chapter 23, and we'll begin in verse 12. When it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink, until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who formed this plot. They came to the chief priests and the elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a solemn oath to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, you and the council notify the commander to bring him down to you, as though you were going to determine his case by a more thorough investigation. And we, for our part, are ready to slay him before he comes near the place. But the son of Paul's sister heard the ambush, and he came and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and, to him and said, Lead this young man to the commander, for he has something to report to him. So he took him and led him to the commander and said, Paul the prisoner called me to him and asked me to lead this young man to you since he has something to tell you. The commander took him by the hand, stepping aside, began to inquire of him privately. What is it that you have to report to me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask, to ask you to bring Paul down tomorrow to the council, as though they were going to inquire somewhat more thoroughly about him. So do not listen to them, for more than 40 of them are lying in wait for him to have bound themselves under a curse not to eat or drink until they slay him. And now they are ready and waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man go, instructing him, tell no one that you have notified me of these things. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's continue standing as we continue singing this hymn of our faith, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Dr. Keston will get there, <laughs> but the problem that we've got is that some of the brethren are ignorant, uh -oh. and we don't want to be ignorant. And in that verse we sang, here I raise my Ebenezer. Uh, would you please enlighten us? Who is Ebenezer? What are we doing? It's actually, what is Ebenezer? It's a uh, reference to 1 Samuel 7, 12, I believe, where Samuel and the people of, of the Israelites had just seen God move in their lives in a mighty way, and they put down the stone of remembrance, or stone, and it says, here I raise mine Ebenezer, so it's a marker in their lives of what the Lord had done. Uh -huh. That 
that probably ranks as the best answer I ever got to that question. <laughs> you My just, biology professor would be proud. You, yeah, well, you just earned a raise. Uh, and, uh, well, that's not bad. Now, that's exactly right. Aben is stone, Aetzer is help of a stone of help. And you don't need to be singing anything you don't know, okay? Now, how many of you didn't have a Fig Newton's idea what that meant? Let me see your hands, be honest. All right, so see, you have learned something today. That's good. Here I raise my stone of help. It's also important in Genesis because God said, not good for a man to be alone. I'm going to make an eight ser connecto for him, a helper corresponding to him. So you know that word now, eight ser. Now, Dr. Kasten, We'll see if you're as good as finding your place in that musical production as you were in defining Age Sarah. Let's sing. Let's pick up to 28 and pick up to 28 going into the third verse and. Oh, to grace, how great a day. Amen. Thank you. I hope Dr. Patterson doesn't suddenly interrupt my sermon <laughs> to explain. And as the, the term Ebenezer also means that God has helped us so far to this point, and we trust he will continue to do so. Dr. Patterson, thank you for that uh, uh, very undeserved introduction and words of explanation. And thank you for this seminary. My wife and I, who are both graduates here, uh, love the Hill. We love all of you and thank God. I believe this is one of the great forces for good and God in all of human history. And uh, you are living in history to be under the leadership of this man because at, at some point uh, when he's about 120 and the Christian history books are rewritten, he will be in that book. And uh, also, I found out today, I've just been told I'm getting old in your own unique way, and that I'll be leaving our church soon, going to glory, and one of you will be the pastor. So, <laughs> All right, let's get down to business. Uh, speaking of being carnal, how many of you are really pumped that the new Star Wars movie is coming out? Uh, I almost had a riot at Truett McConnell about two weeks ago when I mentioned that. They, they almost all left thinking it was out. <laughs> but um, I, I experienced the ultimate spoiler some years ago with so many others. I was standing in line waiting to see the second film in that series, The Empire Strikes Back. And as I was waiting to go in in a line that stretched around the movie theater in Oklahoma, one of my young men from our church came out and excitedly said, hey, dude, pastor, you won't believe it. Darth Vader is Luke's dad. Bye. <laughs> I felt like he had gone over to the dark side. <laughs> well, uh, Han Solo, of course, is part of Star Wars, and you know him as Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford was asked, you, have you received any wisdom from the idea of the Force being with you? That famous line from Star Wars. He said, well, the force being with you is a charming idea, but he said, you are the force, and you are the one who changes your life. 
I would disagree with that movie icon. You see, Jesus Christ is the force. It is by his help that we have come this far and by his grace. And so I want you to take your Bible and turn to Jude 24 and Jude 25. Now, I'm going to do a quick flyover of verse 25, but also try to land the plane on verse 24 because of our time today. Like Harrison Ford, many think that they are the force that changes their lives. I have been to an AA meeting, not, not because I was an addict, but to try to understand. And uh, they often will talk about the serenity prayer. But recently I read a new version to the serenity prayer, and it goes like this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the people I cannot change, the courage to change the one I can, and the wisdom to know it's me. I call that, though, the futility prayer, because you and I cannot change ourselves. I don't care how courageous or wise you think you are, the force is not with you. And the only force in the world is not some inanimate, abstract uh, force of nature, but the power of the living Lord. He is able. Would you stand to honor the reading of God's Word? Now, I have to be, give a word of explanation. Most of our people are biblically illiterate in our church. Many of them are new Christians, most from the north and the northeast. And so we make much of the scripture in the worship services. I use probably more scriptures. I will uh, speak and have them turn. And one of the things that I do when I preach at a seminary, as is my joy today, is to share a passage and a message that I have recently preached from. And so you are hearing a new sermon that I have preached to my own people. In Jude 24 and 25, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. There is really no key to victory because the door is always open. It's not hide and seek. It is the fact that we have availability to his ability. Now, so many in the younger generation, and I know that I'm speaking to many of you, have been told that you can have it all, that you can have the American dream. And yet so many in our culture today are finding that's not the case. There are fewer jobs. We have uh, a, 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 an unstable economy at best. We have an $18 trillion national debt. And many Americans feel powerless in the face of increasing government intervention and intrusion. And more and more uh, government instability. We have more social inter inter interaction because of social media and less true relational connection. We have more and more and yet less and less. And the good news is he, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our great God, to whom belongs dominion and authority and power, he is able. Now, whenever I preach at our church, I always sit down on the front because I want to be a part of the worship experience. And I want to see uh, also what's going on on the stage. <laughs> but uh, as I walk up the steps every week, Saturday night and Sunday morning multiple times, I am saying, Lord, I can't, but you can. Lord, I'm not able, but you are. And I'm asking you to, as uh, one translation of Philippians 4.13 says, Lord, do this. I can do anything and everything through him who constantly pours his strength in and through me. He is able. That's the title of my message, basically. Able. He can do exceedingly abundant because he is able, Ephesians 3.20 says. 
He is able to do more abundantly than all that we could ask or think to his power, his dunamis, his ability that is at work within us. Now, I have basically two points this morning. God is able to keep you from stumbling in the race and defaming his name. God is able to keep you from stumbling. And we are in the race, as Hebrews says, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's a marathon and not a sprint. And I want to uh, walk into the presence, be carried up into the presence of the Lord, as Jude said, with great joy. By the way, the word keep here means watch care in case of attack. And to uh, not stumble is to be literally sure-footed. It's amazing how uh, so many in our culture have accepted a Disney theology. Dream it and you can do it. Wish upon a star. It's sort of more frozen than magical. And the problem with that is you can dream it all day and not be able to do it. He and he alone is able. Now, God is able to keep and help you as you victoriously walk. It's the walk in the Spirit. But you see, we face tripping and temptation at the same time. Paul said he was running that race and Satan hindered him. That literally means he cut in on him in the race. Now, uh, I believe that uh, there is, a, is an amazing sense of both God's activity and our cooperation with his activity. Look with me in Jude once again in the verses just prior to this. There is God at work, but also he is at work in us to will and do of his good pleasure, Paul said. And Jude says this, listen, there is a certain degree of activity on our part, cooperation in obedience and in faith. And he said in verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. So Paul, right off the bat, is saying there is something we must do. There is a, a cooperation with his operation, our availability to his ability. So keeping that in mind, regardless of tripping in our walk, we still get up. We still, though we fall, Psalm, uh, Psalm 37, 24 says, Though you fall, you will not be hurled headlong, for the Lord upholds you with his hand. Now, I have a little uh, one-year-old grandson named Noah. And uh, at his birthday party Sunday night, Noah decided to show off for us and demonstrate his new walking ability. And, and a one-year-old, I mean, we're, we're just ready to sing the Hallelujah Chorus, you know. And so Noah just sort of, you know, walks like this. Now, Daddy uh, stepped up right behind him. And uh, uh, unfortunately, my son-in-law is a Southern seminary graduate. But anyway, uh, and of course, he knew that Noah wouldn't fall as a result of that. But <laughs> did you get that? So uh, Eric is standing right behind Noah. And uh, Noah, Noah's just sort of like Frankenstein walking, you know. And he takes a few steps and bam, there he goes. So he gets up again and he takes a few more steps and then suddenly he goes into Superman pose. At one, like, I am so cool. I just walked five steps. But you see, you cannot be proud because daddy is there to catch you. Daddy is there to cushion and to show you how to walk. Thank God, though, when I do stumble, there is the throne of grace. Now, your, your enemies, and you will have some, will discourage you or try to devour you. Your friends will defend you, and God wants to develop and disciple you through all of that. And I realized one day, as I was pastoring a church, I thought everybody liked me, but I discovered one day that that wasn't the case. And that even when I stumbled, I could go to the throne of grace and find help in time of need. And that the Lord was always there, 
because he is able to keep you from stumbling. And as uh, the proverb said, the righteous fall seven times and rise again in Proverbs 24, 16. Just a few weeks ago, a young adult criticized me on Facebook. He had left our church, and uh, for some reason, I can't imagine why he would leave our church. But the fact is, he was criticizing me, and my first reaction was to defend myself. And then I said to my wife, Janet, you know, I'm so glad he doesn't know about me what God knows about me. You know, sometimes we will stumble over our stumbles, and uh, we'll be tripped up by our past. But that was then, this is now. It's not where you've been, it's where you're going. And one day the Lord is going to help you and uh, lift you up, and one day we will be in his presence with great joy. I can't wait. But the issue is, if you fall, get up. If you stumble and you're about to fall, the Lord upholds you with his righteous right hand. I know some of us are afraid to step out. The old saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, relates to everything except skydiving. <laughs> you know, there was a, a, an army soldier and, and uh, Sarge said, I want you to join airborne, be a paratrooper. He said, uh, no way, Sarge. What's the matter, are you a chicken? He said, no, sir, I, I, I just hate to tackle something I have to get right on the first try. Because, you see, we are jumping out and leaping in faith. And yet the Lord says, listen, if you fall, get up. You fall down, get up, because I am able to help you with preventative power as well as remedial grace. Because the Lord is able to keep you from stumbling, to keep you from messing up. And so regardless of temptations, we look up. The Bible says Jesus suffered when tempted and is able to help those who are being tempted. And by the way, the word help there is the word picture as I understand it. I, I'm not near the Greek scholar. Some of you are, of course. But it's the idea of a father running to the cry of his child to give help. And you and I can do that. We can run to the Lord and cry out to him. He is able to hear and to help. He inclined to my cry and lifted me out of the miry pit. I was uh, some years ago in a pastorate, and a beautiful woman who had been a model and uh, had, uh, well, she was drop-dead gorgeous. And uh, she was just showing up everywhere I was. And, and I suddenly realized that she had an interest in me as ugly as I was. And uh, she would want to counsel me, and I was too dumb to realize what was going on. I was too, uh, too naive to realize that, that uh, it's really best for men not to counsel women alone. And so one day, she put the Potiphar's wife move on me and said these words to me. I, I've always wondered what it would be like to have sex with a pastor. And I felt the hot breath of Satan breathing down my neck. I felt like I was standing, Dr. Patterson, on the edge of the abyss and about to fall. And I cried out to the Lord, and the Lord gave me the words to say, leave. Wasn't very profound. You may leave now. Why? Because you see in 1 Corinthians, 10, it says in verse 12 and 13, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. I needed to hear that in that moment. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. There's that word. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you may be able to to endure it. The way is Jesus. The way, the definite article is used there. The way, not many ways. He, he is able and provides the way of escape that you may be able to be victorious. But he is also able to keep and help you as you persistently serve, not just as you victoriously walk with great joy. 
A high-profile pastor lost his ministry this summer and his marriage. And it became known all over the country. He had become, uh, as a young man, in a, in a very uh, high uh, arc and trajectory, very famous rather quickly, and he fell. And I, I was out in Colorado at the time, and I went before the Lord, and I said, Lord, I want you to show me how to finish with great joy. And so as I wrote down these questions, I began to penetrate my own heart, my own uh, motives, and, and my own walk. I read Jonathan Edwards' resolution, resolved to follow God with all my heart, whether others do or not, I will. And so seven questions I want to ask you that I ask myself. Would you still have the joy of the Lord even if physically incapacitated? Would you love Jesus even if the love of your life left you? Would you serve Jesus even if you lost your church or your ministry position? Would you strive for righteousness even when it doesn't seem that you get a reward? Would you keep praying even if your answers don't seem to come as you think they would or should? Would you love the bride of the church even though her dress is dirty and she is flawed? And would you get up and look up in repentance if you stumble in sin? All of these questions must be asked. Ron Dunn, some years ago, made, a, made an interesting observation about Jesus. And, and in my own uh, way of telling, I, wanna, I want you to know that as a pastor of 45 years, sometimes, somewhere with somebody, you're going to have a negative experience that will make you question your call. And uh, can you imagine if Jesus returned back to heaven after about a year and a half and the angel said to him, uh, Lord, why are you back so soon? Did you finish your job early? And Jesus said, I have those people. Ah, I've had it with them. They don't appreciate me. They, they didn't like me. They didn't, they didn't treat me right. And you should hear what they said about my mom. I've had it with them. Thank God Jesus didn't do that because he set his face like flint and he went all the way to the cross. A few years ago, when my, after my parents had been dead and gone for a while, I was able to visit their grave out in the country, not rural, country in Mississippi. It was so hard to get to. There wasn't a flight anywhere near their grave. And so when I finally got there and uh, walked up to their grave at sunset, I was stunned. I looked at the headstone, and there were their names, and it simply said, the parents of Reverend Hayes Wicker. And when I saw that, that REV, it didn't have DR in front of it, thanks to Southwestern. It was REV, and what they were saying years ago, before they had died, and, and even before they uh, knew what my ministry would be like. They had purchased that headstone believing that I would have a long obedience in the same direction and that their investment would pay dividends in my ministry. They believed that I would be Reverend Hayes Wicker long after they died. And I was so shocked by that. Uh, it, it, see, it may not strike you as it did me, but I got down on my knees and recommitted myself to finish well and strong in the ministry. But you see, God is also able, and I'll very quickly jump into this, to keep you from fumbling the ball and losing the game. Not only to keep from falling on your face in sin, but to keep from falling from grace. It, it, so many people in our churches think they're going to carry the ball, and in the last second of the game, they're on the one-yard line, and that they'll fumble the ball, lose the game, or that is heaven and salvation. But the Lord will not only help you, help you, he's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his presence, blameless with great joy. Now, that means that you're saved by faith, and not kept by works. That your ability to hold out and hang on and go through 
is all because he is able in eternal security. So that means acknowledge his power to keep you forever. I just preached this to our people. I know many of them thought that they could lose their salvation if they fumbled the ball. But Jesus said this in John, John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Why? He is able. He is able. He doesn't let you down. He doesn't give up on you because he doesn't wimp out or check out. He is able. He is the great God and Savior. And that's why this wonderful doxology ends with praise the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He gets all the worship. Can you imagine in your sanctified imagination, Satan saying, Jesus, I want that Hayes wicker. And Jesus says, you can't have him. I purchased him on the cross. Justice was served on Calvary. The debt was paid, the check was written, and the check cleared in the resurrection. And Satan yells, but he has stumbled and he has fallen to my temptation. And Jesus says, I know, but I have forgiven him and he is mine. I have credited my righteousness to his account. And Satan says, I don't care. I am Lucifer. And I can hear Jesus say, Lucy, I am that I am, King of kings and Lord of lords. Get your hands off my property and be gone. Accept his gift of eternal life. We've said it again and again. It's quality and quantity. He gives it to you now. We receive it. We accept it. And he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. Hebrews 7.25 able to save forever all who come to him. And that word come is so important. Dr. Patterson, I just realized this a couple of weeks ago. It's to come in response to an invitation. To come with consent in response to an invitation. I give three invitations to come to Christ in every single worship service. I believe we ought to give an invitation. I believe we dare not gather together without giving the gospel. Because when you look at Paul and the apostles, they always preach Christ, the only Savior who could not only forgive but keep forever. And Paul's testimony was more about an event than an experience. Keep that in mind. The resurrection of Jesus Christ the power of God over sin and death and Satan and hell. He is able. And I think that's why Jude wrote this little book. You know, as Jesus' half-brother, Jude wasn't real thrilled with Jesus until after the resurrection. You know, you, you've heard probably it said that, that uh, as an unbeliever, growing up in the household with Jesus as the older brother must have been a little hard. When Joseph would say, Jude... Why, why don't you act like Jesus? And he probably said, and Dad, why, why aren't you like Jesus? You know, can you imagine? But I, when I see this testimony and this doxology, it could well flow out of the testimony of Jude when he saw Jesus as resurrected Lord and Savior and said, Lord Jesus, I repent of my rebellion. I repent of trying to bring you home and do an intervention thinking you were crazy and needing counseling. Jesus, I saw you as a good carpenter, and now I see you as the great God. I, I see you now not as my older brother, but as my great king who deserves all the dominion and authority, the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Amen. And it could be that his profession of faith became his profession of praise in this book. Let me close quickly. Just after moving to Naples, Florida, which is right next to the Everglades, I was out at a hunting camp in the fall. 
and left the hunt, uh, hunting camp late at night. I was driving through the rain in my little Honda, and suddenly going about 75 miles an hour, I had to dodge a wild boar that crossed the road. The car went into a flip. I, I completely rolled 306 degrees out into the swamp. Breaking ribs, uh, glass, uh, knocking the window out, glass in my face, glass in my head, cutting me, uh, and I was in shock. A man drove up, looked at me, and went on. And I'm laying like this in the ditch inside the car. I tried to call my wife on my little mounted phone. In those days, we didn't have cell phones. They were mounted. And I couldn't get the words out. I was too much in shock. And suddenly, a young Hispanic man, out of nowhere, put his hand inside that broken window, took the phone out of my hand, explained to my wife that I was alive, I was really okay, where we were, he said, I'll call 911, I'll call the hospital and the paramedics, and I'll stay with him until they come, and then I passed out. And when they came, I don't even remember what happened to that young man. And I was okay. And whether he was an angel or not, I don't know. But I do know that there are times in my life when I have crashed spiritually and ministerially, and the Lord is the only one who can reach in and explain what's going on and empower me to do what I need to do and stay with me, and he will never leave you or forsake you. May you realize how able he really is all the days of your life in that long obedience in the same direction as Peterson said. Dr. Patterson. Thank you very much, Dr. Wicker, for a message reminding us of our own fallibility, but his infallibility. And thank you for uh, the pleasant reminder that we are safe in Christ. And so uh, Dr. Wicker will be here at the front to talk to you in a minute after we close. And uh, you come by and get acquainted with a great man of God who's had a fabulous ministry across these years. And may God grant you many more years because your successor is not quite yet ready. And uh, so uh, we pray that he'll give you many more years of ministry. Now, folks, tomorrow in chapel, uh, Kelvin Cochran will be with us. Uh, he's going to have copies of his book here. Uh, You've got to have 1,500 to graduate, but this is one uh, entitled, Who Told You That You Were Naked? And this is the book that got him fired. Uh, he uh, printed this book and was giving it to people as the fire chief of Atlanta, Georgia, and the mayor fired him for it. Can you believe that? You're going to get to hear him tomorrow. It's going to be a fabulous testimony. You will never forget it as long as you live. You're not going to catch a bit of anger or fury in Kelvin Cochran. He's going to come. He'll probably be complimentary of the mayor of Atlanta. I won't be, but he probably will be. And uh, if, if he follows his standard rule, he'll have nothing but good to say about him. But you're going to see a great man of God who worked as fire chief there, and, uh, and how God is now using him and giving him a ministry beyond anything he could ever have had as fire chief in Atlanta. And the thing I want you to think about tomorrow as you listen to him is I want you to see that all those terrible things that happened to you, they're not terrible. They're just God paving the way for what he's going to do with you. So Joseph, down in the pit, being sold into slavery in Egypt, down there with Potiphar's wife, then in prison. Has God forsaken you? No, he's just getting you ready to put you in the position he wants to put you in. And he will greatly use you if you don't faint in the process of it. So that's what I want you to be thinking about tomorrow as you hear Kelvin Cochran right here. 
and it'll be a wonderful day, bring you a few extra pennies so you can buy a copy of his book that's going to get to be a more and more and more and more famous book every day that goes by, and I hope you'll purchase one, help him out along the way. So that is what to look forward to tomorrow. I hope you'll be praying for a number of us. Mrs. Patterson gives her paper uh, in a few moments out at the conference on the family, about 3,000 people out there in Salt Lake City. Uh, Candy Finch is uh, reading a paper also. Uh, Evan Lino is uh, reading a paper. And we've got 12 students out there uh, that are participating in it. And as you know, that's in an area where Christ is greatly needed. And so would you pray for all of them as they uh, give those papers today and tomorrow and uh, that God will use that witness. All right, let's stand together and we're going to sing whatever the intelligent, highly theologically erudite uh, Dr. Caston has chosen for us to sing. How impressive. And uh, so uh, he'll lead us in singing and then Dr. Wicker will be right down here to say a word to you. you 